Good morning, everyone. This is Jim Chastain with Easy Power. Welcome to our Tuesday Refresher. And uh, today we're talking about how to model generators in Easy Power. And we have uh, probably more information than we want to, than we have time to allocate to it. So let's jump into it. Those of you that attended last Thursday's presentation uh, by uh, our friends at GE on uh, TCC short circuit protection and mitigation uh, in dealing with the upcoming changes in the NEC, I think we're treated to a very uh, informative presentation. And for those of you that missed it, it will be, a recorded version will be available and posted on the website uh, by the end of this week. But one of the things that came up, and I've had a request since then, is specifically how to show arc fault current tick marks on the TCC. So we're going to spend a few minutes on that, and then we're going to jump into the, uh, the discussion on generators. Basically, the, there's a, a very simple procedure to put a tick mark representing the arcing current on any particular bus involving uh, easy power and that is you fault a you plot the TCC then you fault a single bus and then you select the curve of the active protective device that that device that is uh, tripping to quench the arc on that particular bus and then by right clicking on the curve of that device and requesting that the tick mark be inserted for the arcing current, it will show up on the TCC. Now, just as an aside, we will be doing uh, this. This topic falls into several different categories. One of which is most frequently made uh, errors doing an arc flash study. So we're going to talk more about it next week. But we will actually have some focused refreshers on. Uh, on all the additional information on the TCC curves and how to deal with or customize other tick marks in addition to just the arcing tick marks. So let's show this real quick. Here we have uh, a typical distribution system. We have several relays in series. When we go into short circuit focus and fault the buses, uh, we don't see anything amiss. The currents all look reasonable. And the next logical procedure would be to go into coordination, well, actually, to calculate incident energy. And as we do that, we might want to look at the uh, uh, spreadsheet that tells us how things are being calculated. So that's the function of this icon in the top center, arranged for arc flash which shows me both the one-line diagram, the incident energies, and how those energies were calculated on each, each bus. So let's go down and, and fault just one bus and focus on this, uh, basically where the motor's connected to uh, the feeder system. And we see that we have bolted fault current of over 13,870 amps. The arcing current is 8,270. And so there's a trip time. But if we kind of notice, the trip upstream tripping device is actually one above what we'd expect it to be. It's not BL2, which is the feeder. It's actually the main on bus 2. Now, the first, and I've been, been uh, susceptible to missing this point as well. One of the first things to check for is on our short circuit options, if we're including or excluding the main, uh, specifically if this breaker were down and considered the main on this bus, which it's not. And in any case, we're including the main for doing the calculation. So that has nothing to do with this particular case. So at early instances seem to indicate that there's miscoordination. So for several reasons, I want to go in and look at the, uh, the arcing current and respective tripping devices. So we go to coordination. Let's go ahead and plot the TC curves for three protective devices and the motor. And as we kind of look at this, let's go back and fault this single bus. 
double click on it we've got again our three different devices and one would hope that our down our most downstream device BL2 uh, would be the the tripping device if it were we were able to right click on that particular curve insert the insert the arcing tick mark but in this case it says it can't do it because it's not in it's not the one that's causing the, uh, the clearing clearing time so just for grins I'm going to go ahead and jump to the the up, most upstream bus BL5 which is this adjustable breaker up here now we can see miscoordination even at this point now I really didn't think that this would be the clearing the clearing device but I just wanted to show you that if I don't pick the correct and sometimes these are overlapping, so you need to be a little careful how you're how you're singling out a specific device. But since we know BL4 is the tripping device, we're going to right-click on that bus and insert the arcing mark, the tick mark. And what we see is a small triangle that shows up on the TC curve, and it's showing 8,184 amps, which is just shy of the 8,200 amps it was indicated on our spreadsheet but the other thing we can notice is that sure enough when we're looking at the purple curve there's just a sliver of time according to the data sheet where it will trip faster it's guaranteed to trip faster the tripping point is determined where this tick mark crosses the upper or right hand side of the plotted curve and so since the teal or blue curve is uh, slightly higher, then that difference prevents uh, the, the downstream breaker from tripping first. Or at least the manufacturer guarantees that uh, it will trip at that point. And, uh, and so we're left with the dilemma of whether or not accepting this miscoordination or try to make some adjustments either to slow down the upstream or to delay its uh, clearing time to give the uh, downstream breaker to a chance to clear. All right, so the uh, we can't we can't display this curve if we have multiple buses faulted. All right, so when I when I fault all the buses out here, which is what we're seeing evidence of, then I can't show the uh, arcing tick mark. If I fault just a single bus, it does display the arcing tick mark as long as we've uh, selected the correct uh, device. Now, if I select the upstream bus and fault it, now I'm not even sure which one trips first here. It looks like it ought to be the... It's still... It's still the uh, the purple bus or BL four is one that we're looking at. So it's it's endless and and it's showing an arcing current that's higher if this is a bus that's faulting. Okay, well um, again, the procedure is what carries the day here, and and uh, I would encourage you not to get frustrated. If you uh, try to insert the tick, arc, tick mark and it tells you that you can't do it, and so my recommendation is to go back to this basic procedure, which is plot the curves that you want to see uh, the fault on, fault just one bus, a single bus, and then select the uh, active curve on the TC plot, right-click and insert arcing mark. If if you can't find, if for some reason it resists showing you the arcing tick mark, go back to the short circuit focus and satisfy for yourself that the uh, you've selected the correct upstream protective device. We'll come back to this if there's any questions. Let me jump on into the uh, generator discussion and uh, we'll pick up questions at the tail end. So a generator's short circuit current is calculated from the subtransient reactants. 
Uh, the subtransient reactance is an impedance value that entirely neglects or pretty much neglects the resistance of the component. So in a generator, this is justifiable based upon the physical characteristics and the construction of the electric generator. So the resistance of the windings in a synchronous generator is generally very, very small compared to the reactants, but they do play a role in the decay rates and so they'll come back into the discussion when we're talking about LR time constants. During a short circuit, the steady state reactance is temporarily reduced due to the interaction of the magnetic flux between the damper windings and the armature windings. Um, this, is, this is more so when there's damper windings, but uh, it's there even if you don't have damper windings. The damper windings are used to stabilize the rotor by inducing uh, an electromagnetic torque that resists motor motion or uh, hunting. This reactance reduction is temporary, but its sudden drop allow much higher instantaneous short circuit current, and this happens in generators even without these damper windings. It's just not as pronounced. Well, because of these complex physical and electromagnetic relationships, the sub-transient reactance is typically determined by testing and must be provided by the manufacturer. The flow of the current in an AC circuit is controlled by impedance. When a short circuit fault occurs, uh, the current flow is a function of the internal voltage of the connected supplies, um, usually utilities, generators, and motors as the motors become a source during a fault, the impedance of those sources, and then the impedance to the point of the fault, which is usually mostly cable impedance. And then finally, the impedance of the fault itself, if it's an arc. Well, in the case of a system that's dominated or supplied by a generator, the internal voltage of the generator and impedance determines the current flow where the terminals of the generator are shorted. So the effect of the armature reaction on the generator air gap flux causes the current to decay over time from an initial high value to a steady state value dependent upon the generator reactances. Since the generator resistance is neg negligible, we really only need to look at the reactants themselves. So these three time zones fall into the first six seconds or so, six cycles or so, and that's referred to as the sub-transient region. And then the transient envelope pretty much uh, occupies the space between the six cycle point and five cycles. And then beyond that is referred to as the steady state region. So um, thanks to uh, some published white papers from the Cummings Power Generation folks, Here's some typical three-phase values for uh, subtransient and transient reactants. So normally the subtransient reactants is referred to as an X double prime, and the D refers to the direct axis of the generator. Uh, the range is usually in uh, the 0.09 to 0.17 seconds, uh, excuse me, uh, per unit value. And this determines the max current at the instantaneous trip uh, during a short circuit fault. And again, the effective time is from zero to six cycles. Then the transient reactance, which happens during the, the next period of time between the six cycle point and the five cycle point, is that uh, impedance that determines the short circuit during a short time pickup of circuit breakers. And the range for that per unit value is usually 0.13 to 0.2. And then the synchronous reactance or steady state reactance determines what the short circuit current is um, without excitation, excitation as long as the uh, generator is turning. And so that impedance uh, ranges between 1.7 and 3.3 per unit. And it's in, in play or invoked, usually after five seconds after the fault. There's also usually a spec for zero sequence reactants, which is referred to as X sub zero. And it ends up being 
0.06 to 0.09, and it factors into a single line to ground fault. We talked a little bit about the L over R time constants, and uh, while that's a little more complicated than just an L over R calculation, uh, these the three primary terms that are that are utilized in analysis, or at least in plotting the the TCC curves for the generator involve the direct direct axis transient short circuit time constant, uh, which the time in seconds required for the transient alternating component to decrease to uh, 0.36 times its initial value. Then the direct axis subtransient short circuit time constant, uh, again in seconds, it's the time required for the alternating component of the short circuit current to decrease to 0.368 times its initial value. And then the direct axis transient open circuit, it's the time in seconds required for the alternating component of the open circuit circuit to decrease to uh, 0.368 times its initial value. Well now, most all of these are, like I say, you want to refer to the manufacturer's data sheet. Uh, there are times when it's worthwhile having an average value or a typical value Again, this uh, I picked up from a paper published by the University of Idaho, and uh, for just general reference, these are, are values that could be used in doing some initial calculations. But more significant is the fact that we're now, when we get into easy power, we have dialog boxes that we want to be as accurate as we can based upon the generator that we have in, uh, to model. And fortunately, here in the last uh, couple months, I've had uh, some of our friends send in information on some specific generators and the full data sheet, which I'm not always privy to or, or get access to. And so I've highlighted what these values are and quite literally, we just take these this information and plug it into Easy Power, and uh, and we're able to model the the generator. So let's jump into Easy Power and uh, see how this works. So the first thing I want to do is in uh, database edit. Let's go ahead and put a generator in the circuit, and let's assume it's this the same generator that we have the data sheet for and we can see that it's uh, 480 volts its rating is uh, 1250 kVA and based upon these typical values and the RPM which is a function of the uh, the number of poles it's going to have usually in this case is 1800. Now not all, all of these elements uh, work into the calculations, but it's good to have the information recorded when we're first generating the system. So we calculate the X over R. If we're going to be modeling power flow, we want to have at least one power source designated as a swing power source. Uh, we're not going to be running power flow this morning, so I'm not going to worry about it. Now we get to the uh, impedance tab. And here's where we start using the, the reactants. So X double prime from our chart was 30. And so the uh, data sheet shows per unit we want to use uh, percentage here. So it shows 13.9. And for the uh, transit reactants, we have 22.11. And for the zero voltage, 7.53. All right, so that, what that does, now so this allows me to calculate my short circuit, instantaneous short circuit, and in fact, the plots at, at the points that I need to set up protective devices for both the instantaneous and, uh, and short-term pickup. I also want to set, be able to plot the damage curves and the supply of the current from the trans from the generator during a fault, 
And so that's where we come to the uh, TCC uh, curves. And we're going to enter it with field forcing information, although they didn't give us the uh, I squared T value, so we can't plot the decrement curve for this particular transformer. But we do have the X sub D, which is 349%. The T double prime is 0 0.0066. So this is seconds. It's not per unit. So we're entering the numbers as they were given. 0.275 and 0 0.0. And then we, we were able to capture the field forcing per unit, which is 10.6. And I haven't gone through the derivation of that, but if that's something you would uh, like information on, let me know. Now that I've got these uh, this data entered, I can go into my coordination module, plot the TCC for that. Uh, well, first of all, I can short the to get my short circuit current, which doesn't look right. So let's go back and see where I made a mistake. Clearly on my KVA, I made a mistake. Entering the data correctly is a big part of the task here. And as I changed my units, it didn't it didn't like the value I, I had entered. So this is 12.7, 12 12.5, 12.52, if I go back and double check, 12.50, KVA. That should be a little bit more civil. So now as I fault short circuit, All right, so now I have more of a realistic uh, short circuit fault, fault current. And my supply curve for a fault using this particular generator. And this all falls out of the calculations that are uh, part of the ANSI standard on magnetic, rotating magnetic machinery. All right, I think that pretty much captures everything I wanted to cover. Let's see if I have any other notes here before we check on questions. I do want to mention that uh, next week we are, the topic is the 10 most common mistakes in arc flash analysis and how to troubleshoot them. And I'm finding that uh, even though the list is, is limited to 10, the the examples for each and how to work with it is going to take up a considerable amount of time. So the topic may run into multiple sessions. So I encourage you uh, to attend, as well as those of you that have not uh, been through our four-part weekly series on how to reduce the cost of ArcFlash compliant, compliance the easy way, that series will be starting in March. and. Uh, I encourage you to, to join. It'll be in the same time slot on Tuesday morning, but the, uh, there's four uh, parts to uh, the series, and each of them are hour long. Thank you for attending, and we look forward to everybody, everyone joining us for the session next week. It should be pretty animated. Have a good day.